Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Emily Mooney, and I'm the project lead of the Community Knowledge Program at Wellesley Institute. Before we begin, we wish to acknowledge this land on which the Wellesley Institute operates. For thousands of years, Wellesley, sorry, for thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work and learn on this land. Welcome to our community panel presented by the Community Knowledge Program at Wellesley Institute. The Community Knowledge Program works in research and policy to improve health and health equity in the greater Toronto area through action on the social determinants of health. The Community Knowledge Program is an initiative to encourage collaborative research and knowledge sharing within the immigrant and refugee serving sector in the GTA. Over the past few years, the Community Knowledge Program has been considering how to promote settlement research and evidence-based practice. We have examined successes and challenges, and we've begun building capacity in the sector through our public webinars, training for some frontline workers, and a new community of practice that will grow to support researchers, practitioners, and others engaged in supporting newcomers to our area. In our work, we have found that one of the biggest challenges in the sector today is funding, and I'm sure this isn't news to anyone. In most cases, current funding models leave settlement agencies and other newcomer serving organizations little room for anything other than delivering programs and services. Most agencies have few opportunities to learn about new research in the sector and apply the findings to practice, let alone get involved in conducting research. Recently, Social Planning Toronto produced a major report based on work with community partners to understand funding structures and their effects on how newcomers are welcomed to Canada. Today's panel discussion is intended to give you an overview of the Social Planning Toronto report and to consider ways that new funding models can foster collaborative research and promote evidence-based practices in immigrant settlement. I'm excited about today's panel and I'm looking forward to hearing what everyone has to say. Before we get to the speakers, I wanted to go through a few housekeeping notes. Please bear in mind that this webinar is being recorded. The video and transcript will be available on our website later this month. If you need subtitles, you can enable live transcription by clicking live transcript at the bottom of your screen and clicking show subtitle. We encourage you to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen if you have any questions directly for me or for the panelists. As soon as we finish the discussion, a short survey will appear on your screen in your browser. We would greatly appreciate it if you could stay with us until the end to share your feedback as we will use it to improve our future programming. We're going to start with our panelists' presentations and then we'll come back together for questions afterwards. We have three distinguished panelists who will speak today. First, we will hear from Sharma Kweiser. Sharma is a researcher and policy analyst with Social Planning Toronto, a nonprofit community organization that works to improve equity, social justice, and quality of life in Toronto. She has over 10 years experience in primary and secondary research, policy analysis, advocacy, and community engagement. Her work is focused on a range of social justice issues, including community access to public space, gender equity, academic streaming, poverty reduction, and community safety. Sharma holds a Master of Social Work in Social Justice and Diversity from the University of Toronto. We will also hear from Jennifer Chan. Jennifer is the CEO of the Department of Imaginary Affairs. The Department of Imaginary Affairs is a national not-for-profit organization imagining equitable futures. Jen brings over 15 years of experience working in the nonprofit sector. She's a struggling idealist, recovering perfectionist, and she craves order in her mind and in the world. The DIA works to co-design equitable futures by centering the voices of newcomers and youth, especially those who identify as Black, Indigenous, and people of color to build more empathetic programs, policies, and services. 
Finally, we will hear from Alicia Griffith. Alicia is a community organizer, consultant, and an urban farmer. She is the executive director of Unified We Grow, a nonprofit organization dedicated to increasing the well being of community members by educating, engaging, and empowering them through programs, workshops, and services. Very much looking forward to the discussion today, and let's get started with Sharma Kweiser. Thank you so much for that warm introduction, Emily. Just bear with me while I share my screen for a second. How does that look? Good. Uh, so again, thank you so much for having me this morning. I'm so excited to share with you findings from a recent research report on reimagining settlement funding and service delivery. So Social Planning Toronto produced this report in partnership with the Toronto South Local Immigration Partnership, as well as the Department of Imaginary Affairs. The purpose of this environmental scan was to explore how the current model of funding and service delivery is impacting outcomes for newcomers. We had a particular focus on the experiences of racialized and underserved newcomer communities, as well as smaller people of color led and population specific organizations, such as ethno specific and women serving organizations. Key insights from this environmental scan will be used to inform a participatory co-design process to develop a new possible alternative funding model and service delivery model for the Toronto South area. So my colleague Jen will be speaking a little bit more about that co-design phase of the project. So this project was actually one of 16 initiatives led by local immigration partnerships and funded through IRCC's service delivery improvements, the SDI funding stream. So the research project had three major components to it. Um, we did a sociodemographic profile of the Toronto South area. So using 2016 census of the population data, we produced a snapshot of immigrants, recent immigrants and non-permanent residents in Toronto South area. Uh, we also did a literature review of both scholarly and gray literature covering two major topics. So the key challenges affecting Ontario's settlement sector as well as community-led and participatory funding models. And finally, uh, we did focus groups with newcomers and service providers. We conducted 15 focus groups uh, with 142 newcomers, as well as eight focus groups with 27 staff from settlement agencies. So from this research, we produced a very comprehensive research report, which was over 100 page longs. So I won't be covering everything in the report, but I will encourage you to, to take a look at the report after today's um, webinar. And in particular, I won't be going over the sociodemographic profile of Toronto South area. Um, this profile was used and produced to inform our recruitment and our understanding of Toronto South. Um, so I am gonna skip over that for today's webinar. So key challenges facing the immigrant and refugee serving sector in Ontario. So uh, for many of you that are probably working in this sector, these probably aren't going to be new, but hopefully they resonate with you. Um, so this is going to be based on both the, com uh, the literature review as well as the focus groups. So as Emily mentioned, funding was uh, came up a lot. Um, it was uh, a, a common amongst in the literature review, as well as uh, in the focus groups with service providers. We heard a lot about the need for adequate, predictable and sustainable funding and how this affects the capacity of agencies to meet client needs and ensure equitable access to services. As the largest funder of settlement services in Canada, IRCC has tremendous impact in this area. And in particular, we heard about funding conditions and constraints and how that impacts the ability of organizations to support particular groups of newcomers. So we heard about how IRCC eligibility requirements, which excludes non-permanent residents and Canadian citizens from accessing IRC funded services are a key barrier in exasperating inequitable access to services. 
Um, we also heard about how the lack of uh, or how this eligibility criteria creates a gap across the entire sector in which um, some groups of newcomers are either not served or underserved. And we also heard about the, how the funding conditions and constraints uh, restricts the ability of organizations to provide holistic and needs-based services. So while both newcomers and service providers alike emphasize the importance of providing well-rounded services, which address a range of newcomer needs, this can be made challenging by the limits placed on funding. So for example, when there are restrictions on what the funds can be used for or who can be served for the programs, um, this creates uh, some challenges in, in providing those holistic services. Um, but in order to navigate this issue, we heard from organizations that they seek funding from multiple sources. Um, so they, they cr create a system in which, you know, if a newcomer isn't eligible under this program, maybe they can access services under this program by really maximizing all of the different sources of funding that they can access. However, this isn't without its challenges when organizations are, are, obtaining funding from multiple sources, it requires uh, more time and resources on their end, as well as a greater administrative burden um, required because of the reporting and um, all of the accountability mechanisms required for each funder. And finally, we also heard about insufficient funding for program expenses. So not receiving enough funding for childcare and transportation costs, technical supports for participants and so on. And how these supports, which are supposed to uh, reduce barriers to access um, uh, are limited because of that. So what we see when there isn't enough funding for these program expenses that some groups of, of newcomers such as women, youth, seniors and low income newcomers um, have inequitable access to services. So on this slide, I've highlighted here uh, a quote from a service provider um, participant, which speaks to the issue of accessing multiple sources of funding to provide well-rounded services. So the service provider said, in order to do well-rounded holistic services, we actually do combine funding from different levels of government and the United Way to provide holistic services for a family. And sometimes the family falls in and out of IRCC eligibility. So the service provider went on to talk about how even within a one family unit, uh, the different members of the family may have different eligibility and how that affects um, settlement and uh, service providers ability to serve that family. And I have here another quote from a service provider, which emphasizes the connection between eligibility and issues of equity. So this service provider talked about how refugee claimants are um, not just coming from, are not just racialized people coming from racialized countries, but they're also very poor situation, um, coming from a very poor situation. So refugee claimants is another group of newcomers that are excluded from IRCC funded programs. So this pro service provider was really pointing um, to the connection between eligibility and equity. Um, in both the literature and uh, focus groups, we also heard and talked about evaluation and priority setting. So we heard about program outcomes, which are overly reliant on quantitative targets. So they pr prioritized quantity over quality, and sometimes because of that, fail to recognize the complex needs of high risk and vulnerable newcomers that require more supports. Um, again, because of this, it also disadvantages organizations that specialize in working with high risk and marginalized communities. Service providers also talked about the administrative burden of entering data in eye care and how they then they themselves cannot use the eye care data. So they talked about how eye care is only measuring what IRCC wants to know and not necessarily what is useful for the organization. Um, so because of this, there was really an emphasis on the need to measure quality of service and longer term outcomes 
when it comes to um, settlement services and newcomer services. So program outcomes should center equity and accountability to newcomer communities to be informed by local expertise and create opportunities for innovation and risk taking. There was also um, in the literature and in our conversations a call to expand the role of immigrant and refugee serving organizations in priority setting, funding, decision making and evaluation development specifically and especially including small ethno-specific and women serving women-led organizations. So these small ethno-specific and women serving organizations work with the most marginalized newcomers and have a wealth of knowledge and experience that should be leveraged in these decision-making processes. So here I have a quote. Um, from one of the newcomer participants that really sheds light on what the emphasis on quantitative targets looks like um, and how it appears um, in, in from their perspective. So the newcomer participant said, with a lot of programs, it's like they want to check boxes. It's not about the actual needs of clients or the differences in their abilities or their opportunities. So this newcomer participant was talking about how there's sometimes universal programs that aren't necessarily customized or responsive to the newcomer participant. And then they felt that they could see that. Um, staffing shortages, just like the nonprofit sector in general, staffing shortages uh, is a problem within the immigrant and refugee serving sector. Staffing shortages are driven by employee retirements, high staff turnover, and challenges in retracting and retaining staff due to lack of competitive wages and associated benefits, stressful working conditions, and precarious employment. So we heard about and read about, you know, the employee overwork and burnout and experiences of precarious trauma and compassion fatigue among newcomer and immigrant serving organizations and their staff. And we also heard about the longstanding problems with precarious employment related to funding difficulties. So the challenges with how funding is uh, uh, allocated to organizations and how it's uh, in bits and pieces. And this results in sometimes short-term contracts, multiple part-time positions, um, and just general challenges in employment within the, the newcomer and immigrant serving sector. So as a result, and again, going back to the fact that IRCC is the largest um, funding of settlement services, there was a call for RIC IRCC to address these compensation problems in the sector through, for example, wage scales for specific settlement positions, compensation output targets, minimum compensation requirements, and a national funding mechanism to support compensation improvements within the sector. data and technical capacity. So immigrant and refugee agencies in Ontario demonstrated resilience in their ability to move to online services during the COVID-19 pandemic. So prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, many organizations were um, you know, offering their services only in person and they had to shift to online service delivery during the pandemic. Um, and there were some challenges uh, that organizations faced when they did not have the technical capacity in place prior to the camp pandemic. Um, it required organizational resources. Um, and there were some challenges as well with for staff and for newcomers. So uh, we heard a lot from newcomers about, you know, some newcomers like the online service delivery aspect and some newcomers preferred in person. And um, I think I'm going to come back to this a little bit later, but just to mention that. Uh, data collection also came forward in our literature review, including the identification of relevant data sources and how it relates to a more robust evaluation um, framework. 
So service provider participants talked about the challenges in focusing on specific communities that might be a priority in their local catchment area, but may not be a priority for uh, IRCC or other funders. So without relevant data, or when the demographic data that is available is outdated, um, it makes it difficult to actually make the case for uh, to prioritize those communities. And just to mention in our report, we also kind of looked at another project that's underway by Peace Geek Society. So this project was to explore how technology and innovation can best support settlement outcomes for newcomers. So that's another IRCC project uh, that we thought was really interesting and shed some light on uh, where the next steps can go in this area. So in our focus groups, we specifically wanted to hear about collaboration and how the current funding and service delivery model impacts collaboration between organizations. Um, so we probed for that in our discussions and our conversations with service uh, organizations. And what we heard was that the current funding and service delivery model inadvertently encourages organizations to work in silos. So we heard about a sense of competition, particularly among smaller organizations and organizations serving similar population. So again, as it relates back to the issue of quantitative targets, where the focus becomes on who can count um, this newcomer participant to meet their quota, this makes uh, competition uh, kind of encourages competition and makes collaboration difficult um, because there's great pressure on organizations to meet their target numbers. Um, one client, however, can be reported in iCare as being served by multiple organizations as long as the organizations belong to different categories of services. So this makes again, just adds another complex layer to uh, um, the process of referrals and collaboration um, and what is required in order for two organizations to collaborate. Um, as well, we heard that there is generally a lack of funding for collaborative initiatives. So organizations that do uh, undertake collaborative endeavors are doing it of their own behest and it's uh, often falls on the role of managers. So what we heard was, um, you know, managers are taking this on if it's participating in a coalition or on a committee or any kind of network like that, because they have a bit, I guess, because uh, the, the staff are so focused um, on the service delivery and they don't have that flexibility in order to participate in these in these endeavors. And we also heard about LIPS. So the local immigration partnerships were seen as playing an important role in facilitating dialogue, both amongst sector players, as well between the sector government and stakeholders of common, uh, to discuss issues of common interests. So uh, LIPS were seen as kind of doing very positive work in this area. Um, here I have a quote that talks about how the quantitative um, targets encourages competition. So here a service provider participant said, to have a system that sets up organizations to compete against each other for clients, it's not helpful. It's not in the interest of the newcomer, it's the wrong focus. I totally understand the need for an accountability and for output outcome reporting, but there needs to be a shift in the underlying principles around it. So really, really, I think well said here. And another quote from a service provider that talks about collaboration and referrals. So this service provider said, it's easier for agencies with different specialties to collaborate with each other because under eye care, one client can be repeatedly reported across different agencies while they receive different categories of services. And again, speaking to uh, what I was mentioning about the um, referrals. So I'm actually gonna pause here. Um, I have a second section which kind of looks at the solutions, but at this point in the presentation, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I will invite my colleagues, Jen and Alicia, to uh, provide some comments.
Thanks, Sharma. Um, so first, I want to thank everyone who we can't see your faces, but thank you for taking the time to be here today, um, mostly for your time, your presence, your wisdom, and your curiosity. Um, secondly, Sharma and Emily, thank you for inviting us to be a part of this community knowledge program session. Um, I know amidst everything that's happening in the world, it can be difficult to shift your focus towards something that is really largely intangible um, and asking us to imagine a future that we don't have full control over. Um, so thank you again, Emily, for the land acknowledgement you shared at the beginning of the session, but I'd like to add a bit more and open up this, this next portion in the way that we would open up every focus group, interview, design lab, learning session, and soon our model making sessions. Um, I and this research project are situated on the lands of the Mississauga of the Credit, who are part of the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Wendat, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy of Six Nations, and many, many other nations recorded and unrecorded. The land that we operate on is named Tagaranto, which you might colonially know as Toronto. And it means where the trees meet the water or the gathering place. The work that I do is not possible without acknowledging this country's first and future caretakers and present caretakers. Um, throughout this project, many and many others that I'm working on, I am reminded of my constant duty to take care of these lands in the way it was always intended. So long before contact, the Dish with One Spoon Covenant, which is the agreement that covers um, Toronto, was made between the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. And the dish symbolizes that the bounty that this land has to offer. And I think it's really important to remember that when we are working on a community-based funding models research project. There is enough bounty on this land. Um, I'm Jen, I am a mama, a partner, a sister, a friend, a daughter, and I'm also the co-design lead on this research project. I was born and raised in Toronto and I am a second generation Chinese Canadian settler. As a child of immigrants, I used to hear land acknowledgements and think that they didn't apply to me because I thought I wasn't here when colonization happened, as if that were a really long time ago and as if I weren't benefiting from colonization today. So I and now many others on our team have begun to start every one of our sessions with a personal reconciliation story. And I think it really is an, a symbol and a commitment to solidifying our commitment to truth and reconciliation on the land. And so if it's comfortable to you, I'd invite you to place a part of your body as grounded as you can, whether that be your feet, your bum, your back, if you are lying down, whatever part of you makes you as grounded and committed to the land as possible. And that we're gonna take four deep breaths. Inhale, exhale, one for the land, one for you, one for your ancestors and one for your future. So I wanna thank you again for the time today to think about the future. I am not alone in this project, that is sure. Alicia is with me today and Alicia Griffith is the executive director um, of Unified We Grow and Alicia is one of many of our advisory. So our advisory is a big part of what makes this project different, I think. Um, so we committed ourselves early on in this project to having an advisory that was filled with newcomers and racialized leaders of small and grassroots organizations. Alicia has been committed with us from the very beginning of this project. Um, and it should be known that Alicia offers direct settlement services and is not IRCC funded. And that is a very, very, very specific value and wisdom that Alicia brings to our project and continues to every single time she shows up. Um, so for this portion, I want to share my screen. I'm gonna try to do that now. I'm gonna put it over here. 
Can you see that mentee screen? You can see what I was supposed to be showing while I gave my land acknowledgement. But what I'm gonna do is invite you now to join Menti. So Menti is a tool that we have used throughout this project. And the idea of it was how do we actually integrate data gathering tools that also share that data in real time. And one of our key goals in this project is actually to practice working in the open so that we can learn and adjust while the project is happening rather than when it's over. Um, and so if you take out your phone or you can actually come in through another window on your computer, um, you can either click the link in the chat or you can QR code um, this image. And don't worry if you miss it on this screen because it will actually uh, keep the code at the top of the screen as we move into the next screen and the next screen. Um, and I just want to share that every time that we've done one of our sessions, we always remind people that only share what you are comfortable sharing, that our research is not intended to make you uncomfortable in the moment, it's not worth it, and that your participation and your engagement, however broad, is what you're bringing today, and that's all we ask for. And the goal is not for you to... Um, feel like you don't have enough in order to contribute, but that you are contributing as the human you are today. Um, and so I'm gonna move into our next screen to just basically test um, if the tool is working. And so despite the fact that throughout this project, I have been told to stop talking about the weather because it is a far too um, Canadian thing to do, I continue to put this question here as a way to test if people are using Menti. Um, and so the preference of hot or cold, and that is entirely a subjective question, um, knowing that many of our um, participants are often coming from places that are either, are, are usually much hotter than here. And so when we complain about heat in Toronto, they're often reminding us that that's not a true relative heat. Um, okay, so what we can see is we have a, about a 63 uh, to 38 hot cold, at least in this um, conversation. We have about 24 people who have responded, and we know that there are 48 attendees. So that could be all sorts of reasons why we're getting that data. But part of our work is around receiving the data we get and saying, okay, do we actually have enough to make an opinion? Do we have enough to move forward? And, and are we actually creating different ways for people to engage in our work? So a co-design invitation. This project is not possible unless we mix perspectives. So Sharma mentioned that this project is co-designed um, and it continues to be co-designed with um, stakeholders from across the settlement sector. And so we're inviting you today to participate um, throughout this presentation in the same way that we would um, ask you if you were one of our in one of our focus groups or interviews or design labs or learning sessions. Um, and like I said, the pace of this project does not match the amount of research that is needed. So while we actually have one of the longest of the 16 research projects, um, almost three years, we know that research around funding happened long before this project started and will continue to happen long after our funding has run out. Um, and so this, you know, we continue to keep that in mind as we, as we do this work. So based on what you know right now, how would you describe co-design to your friends and family? I'm just going to leave space for folks to respond. So this is a question we have asked um, all of our participants in our design labs, in our in our 
cohorts of learning. We now have um, a series of learning sessions that are happening where we are actively inviting newcomers and service providers to learn together. Um, and Sharma mentioned earlier that one of the challenges this sector, sector holds is that often frontline service providers are not the ones engaging in systems level conversations. And so we have made a very intentional effort to make sure we have balance when we're writing service providers into our conversations. But we also are working within the existing challenges that the assumption is that frontline workers do not engage in this kind of conversation um, and, and trying to figure out how we can continue to make that an untrue statement. So thank you so much. We have about 15 responses right now. Uh, I'm just going to read a few. Designing with communities who have equal input into the process, as well as analysis. Working in close collaboration with a common vision. Co-design is sharing power and responsibilities in developing and implementing. It's a collaborative process where individuals work together to create or make decisions collectively. Working together with people in needs. Collaborating with others to serve and find resources. A collaborative client-centered approach that involves diverse communities working together to create solutions. So those are just 20 co-design, 21 now, um, ways to describe this work. And one of our goals, despite the fact that typically this kind of work tries to reinforce that we should come to a consensus around every decision we make, one of our principles is actually to gather all and to demonstrate where there are similarities, but also where there are tensions in what we're hearing. And it's not our goal to come up with the one and only answer to every single question that's being asked, because we can't, because then we will automatically uninclude someone's perspective and voice. Um, and so we would much rather show you 22 examples of what something, how people might respond to something rather than being, we heard 22 things, but then we decided that meant one thing. So I've, we've mentioned that we co-design with a bunch of different roles. Um, and so typically in co-design practice, they will talk about sort of three perspectives coming together, living or lived experience, um, professional experience and provocateurs. So I think the best way to sort of imagine that in the settlement sector is newcomers and immigrants who we might typically call clients are what we would consider living experience. Service providers, so like direct service providers. Uh, so that's our frontline staff, that's our management, that's our admin, that's uh, executive directors, everyone that's in direct service delivery, we would consider professionals or service providers. And then folks like Sharma and I, researchers and facilitators, we're what we what you would consider provocateurs. We're the ones who are outside of the context, but are who are working in it with you, um, and that we're committed to passion and curiosity. Um, and so the big parts of this is to make sure is that often in this sector, we say, but our service providers are also newcomers. And we sort of discount client experience. And what we're saying is actually those are different. Uh, while we honor the fact that lots of service providers do themselves have newcomer experience, that we sort of consider it as once you've become a service provider, you're no longer a newcomer only. And so we really try and honor that in this work, um, and which is why we have newcomers who join our co-design cohort who have who are not service providers. And then we have service providers who some have experience as newcomers and some don't. Um, so based on those descriptions, where would you place yourself? So if we're using IRCC terms, you would consider uh, provocateurs as indirect service, service providers as direct service, 
and then newcomers and immigrants as clients or receivers of service. So let's say we were using this example as the people who typically, or the voices we would typically center in research is if we were using this group, we would say we're, we're a primarily service provider group with a then also heavy on the researcher facilitator and very light on newcomer immigrant um, perspectives. And so our goal in our work is to balance that out more often. Um, so for example, we have seven newcomers in our cohort, and then we've been adding service providers to our learning sessions, but we started with our newcomers in our learning sessions this summer. Someone just wrote, I represent a funder. Um, I would put you in provocateur, not in service provider. <laughs> Thanks for that question. Oh, we have a couple more service providers popping in. <laughs> All right. Um, so these are the four co-design principles that we are building off of. These are shared out of K.A. McKesher's work, which is to share power, to use participatory means, to prioritize relationships and to build capacity. So essentially we've been using these principles throughout our project. Um, and what we're witnessing simultaneously is where we actually face challenges and pushbacks in the current funding system. So you can imagine when we are talking about sharing power and prioritizing really, all of these things take way more time way more time. And so when we are talking about um, often working in a sector where targets are high and time is limited, we're actually asking for people to spend more time than they currently feel like they have. And so some of the ways in which we've done that is actually making time for stories to be shared first is to rely on trusted relationships and networks that have already been established, is to do a lot of translation around language and spaces. So Sharma mentioned that we had a bunch of focus groups um, last year, and we did a bunch of focus groups virtually in English only. And we were like, well, that was a very limited subset of perspectives. So in order to do our second round of focus groups and interviews, we worked with seven different languages in order to do those and offered participants the ability to choose if they would prefer those to be in-person or virtual. And that completely changed the way in which we collected data, but also what we heard and who we heard from. Um, we really wanted to focus, shift away from uh, folks who are already engaging with services towards folks who are choosing or not hearing about services. And so we needed to change who and how we were doing that. I'm going to stop because I think that there's more to come. We can come back to this. Um, I want to make sure that we have time for both things that people are going to share but also what um, Alicia might say as someone who is one of our only grassroots uh, representatives within our advisory. Alicia. Um, well, first I'd like to say I'm very grateful to be a part of this project because most of the time grassroots or very, very small organizations, we're not really called to the table, um, but we are used in a way for like an outreach or sharing information or like helping um, bigger agencies in that way. But in terms of actually coming to the table, we're normally like not really viewed as important, even though like we do offer services um and services look different at different levels um so for example like we offer a food support program um we're a for and by type of grassroots so we are 
serving, I guess I would say serving ourselves kind of, um, when Jen said, when you become a service provider, you are kind of different because the flow of information is different. So for example, becoming a service provider puts me in a different position because now information flows through me rather than having to search for information. So that's a very important aspect when it comes to um, newcomers getting involved in a different level. Then it's sort of like, I guess the power dynamics change. Um, in this project, I don't know, it's just, it's such an interesting topic because I learned a lot for myself, um, even having, trying to do um, co-design and other funding and sharing funding is like, you actually have to have capacity to share and you have to, you have to have power to share power. But the number one thing that has been a challenge um, for me that this project has brought up is the capacity to share power. Um, it depends on the group that you're working with. Um, it's sometimes very difficult to do that when you're a grassroots because you end up extending yourself so much more than you actually can do. Like for example, um, I worked at the neighborhood pods and we had a shared funding that we were trying to do, but because of where the community organizers or community groups was at, it was so difficult to have a proper um, participatory budget or sharing that power because some people didn't know how to write, some people didn't know how to read, some people didn't know how to, um, they're not tech savvy. So then it was just like, it ended up being like so much more steps to try to get people at the same level where we're all contributing in a way that um, everybody feels is fair. Because I may think that any contribution is a great contribution, but if the whole group doesn't feel that way, if it feels like, hey, I'm doing this and they're doing that and that's like nothing, um, those dynamics are um, a little bit difficult. But in this project, it's definitely opening up my eyes and being able to speak on um, being grassroots and working with newcomers has been a great opportunity. Any specific questions I can answer. Thank you, Alicia. I think um, one of the things that you brought up that you constantly sort of remind me of is um, you need capacity in order to share power. Um, and I think that that's really true. And I think that even in moments where sometimes you feel like you don't have the capacity to share, you are always so generous with what you are willing to share. And that actually builds the power back into this project. Um, and so I wanna thank you and honor you for your commitment. And the fact that like we are also simultaneously witnessing where uh, power has been kept away from you. So we know, for example, um, this, this year, earlier this year, there were lots of consultations for service providers who receive IRCC funding to contribute to how services uh, and funding might adapt in the future. And Alicia is not invited to those because she's not already IRCC funded. Um, and so we can see in this project how um, the current funding landscape is not centered around that equity piece that we're looking for. Um, and, and to participatory funding money models, which I think Sharma might talk a little bit more about, um, we are consistently sort of learning about the, the need and the desire for uh, power to be shared in order for participatory funding models to be successful. So um, maybe with that, Sharma, I'll toss it back to you. Perfect, wonderful transition, Jen. <laughs> so uh, uh, now I'm going to share a little bit about some of the findings that we came out of literature review. So as Jen was mentioning, we looked at alternative funding models, in particular, um, collaborative go government, delegated decision making, and participatory grant making as, you know, uh, examples inspirational examples on how power has been or can be shared when it comes to uh, funding decisions. 
So collaborative governance brings together individuals to work collectively to develop solutions to complex problems. And delegated decision making is about giving an entity the explicit authority over making a decision, often within some parameters. So when we're talking about delegated decision making when it comes to funding, it really means uh, giving another entity, an, whether it be an organization or a municipal government, the authority to make decisions about how monies are allocated. So there was uh, an example uh, at the federal level of reaching home um, of uh, collaborative government governance and de delegated decision making. So reaching home is part of the federal government's efforts to meet its goals of reducing chronic homelessness by 50% by fiscal year 2027-2028. And so through this initiative, the federal government delegated funding decision making powers to local bodies, what they referred to as community entities in select geographic areas, as well as indigenous and rural and remote communities. So a community entity is was normally an incorporated organization, whether that be a, a municipal government or a nonprofit organization, or I think there was even a United Way that brings together a community advisory board and works with the board to develop a community plan. So a community advisory board uh, comprise a diverse group of stakeholders that include those working on homelessness, public and private funders, agency staff from the community entities and other partners, including people with lived living experiences of homelessness, um, as well sometimes uh, members of government staff and the business sector. So here is a kind of an image that shows the roles of the community advisory board and the community entity in this model. So you can see uh, you know, the community advisory board here on the left is uh, its role is to be representative of the community. So as I mentioned, we have people who work in the sector as well as people with living experience um, on the community advisory board. So there is community participation in the decision making process. So it for us, this was a very interesting example to look at because it was an initiative already at the federal level um, where they are starting to move towards a more horizontal um, structure that pa where power and authority is shared. We also looked at this concept of participatory grant making. Um, so participatory grant making can be considered as both a process as well as an ethos or a set of values. So as a process, it's about engaging community members who are the focus and most affected by grant making in the actual grant making process. So practitioners believe that collective decisions involving residents who are most impacted will produce the best results and will also provide opportunities for long lasting change. So it's really also a set of values and kind of uh, um, principles that drive this work. So it's a means to democratize uh, philanthropy, to share shift and seed powder, power, and to exercise values of equity and inclusion through clear communication, transparency, and trust building. So the goals of participatory grant making are both process and outcome oriented. So it's about building community agency power and leadership. So building the capacity of communities through their participation, um, as well to support better funding outcomes for communities and funders. So as I mentioned, the practitioners really believe that by having those involved um, who, who are affected by the decisions will produce better outcomes. So some considerations is that this process, as Jen was talking about, um, can be more costly and labor intensive. So it takes uh, more time than traditional grant making. Uh, as well, transparency, while transparency is central, privacy and confidentiality can be important in circum cer certain circumstances, such as when working with marginalized individuals who may face danger if their identities are known. So just to acknowledge that this is also a consideration in this process. 
So I have here a draft uh, participatory grant making framework that was proposed by uh, a consultant, Cynthia Gibson. So Cynthia Gibson is a consultant located in the US who has worked a lot in the philanthropic center uh, sector in in particular on participatory grant making. So during her time with the Ford Foundation, she prepared this draft framework, which puts forward kind of four categories of communication between grant makers and non grant makers which all have value and purpose depending on the circumstances. So you can see the first two categories, informing and consulting, are one-way uh, streams of communication. So informing is when grant makers tell and the non-grant makers receive, while consulting is kind of the other way around. So grant makers receive and the non-grant makers tell. And then there's involving, which is a two-way communication uh, two-way communication, but the grant maker still makes the decision. So it's it's a dialogue and a conversation, but the decision and the power still stays in the grant maker. And then finally, on the furthest on the right, we have deciding. So deciding is the two-way communication that leads to joint decision making. So this is when both parties, the grant makers and the non-grant makers, come to a consensus and can make a decision based that is a uh, satisfactory to both of them. So this framework is helpful when you're conceptualizing different levels of community participation in the grant making process. And another helpful tool, um, we actually looked at several different tools for conceptualizing participation um, in our report. And I just wanted to highlight one here, which is Arnstein's Ladder of Citizen Participation. So this is a very popular um, tool, maybe you've heard of it before, but uh, it basically shows eight rungs of a ladder and each rung has a, a level, a different level of participation, starting at the very bottom, which is considered non-participation, it's manipulation there. Um, and then at the very top, citizen control, where citizens actually have the power. So this is a really helpful tool, I think, for conceptualizing and thinking about where along the ladder um, your engagement and community participation lies. So in our literature review, we also looked at another example, which is an example of a participatory grant making um, process. So actually quite local here in Peel region, the West Miriam um, Fund and Tamarack Institute partnered on a participatory grant making process. So um, the fund set uh, the funder set the amount and it was actually $600,000 um, and a broad funding area. So they said that they wanted to focus on immigrants and refugees. And after that, they stepped back from the process. And so Tamarack um, brought their facilitation, community capacity building expertise, their community engagement um, experiences and assembled what they called the people's panel through an open call. So the People's Panel included six representatives from community organizations and six, six newcomers. Um, so they brought various expertise and local knowledge across many areas, and they decided what the fund priorities would be, what the application process would look like, how applications would be assessed, and selected groups to be funded, and then also made decisions about the uh, evaluation process. So they ended up funding uh, six innovative projects in the Peel region. So this process really shifted power from the funder um, who stepped away from kind of making decisions and let the other groups make the decision to newcomers and newcomer serving organizations. Um, it utilized a diversity of, of perspectives on the panel to produce better decisions and also helped build um, power and shared leadership among the group. So unlike traditional grant making, this example of participatory grant making really placed communities at the center and empowered people with living experience. So I think that this was one example that was kind of inspirational in our, you know, our desire and our work in what Jen was talking about on bringing community perspectives to the grant making process. So just a couple of kind of 
key findings and reflections um, from, from our work. So I think from the sum of our findings, both what we heard, what I shared with you in the first half of my presentation, um, it shows that there's significant room for improvement in the current funding and service delivery model to better meet the needs of newcomers and specifically to look for opportunities to more equitably distribute funds across organizational stakeholders to better support data sharing, evaluation, reporting, and uh, feedback, and to set center community in priority setting and funding decisions. So I think Jen is going to talk a little bit more about next steps, but and kind of what we're doing in the co-design process and what we're looking to develop. But these are some of um, kind of the key components and questions that we propose. And here is a reminder to actually go read the full report, which is very extensive. And thank you to Jen for putting that um, also in the chat for everyone to check out. Um, thank you, Sharma. Every time Social Planning Toronto is asked to have to give a summary of a 100-page report, I'm grateful it's not my job. Um, so one of the big things I think about this project is that we wanted to continue to share information as it was happening. Um, and so while the report is lovely and exists, is not everyone's way of learning. Um, and so specifically, if you are in Toronto South, we are about halfway through um, a series of four learning sessions. Um, and I'm actually gonna like just shamelessly plug that if you wanna join the last two learning sessions, um, we are still open to having service providers join um, that. And you'll actually get to see Sharma go further in depth into uh, policy as well as collaborative governance. Um, and so those sessions include both Social Planning Toronto sharing about the findings, but we've also coupled each of those with someone who's like in the work now. Um, and so specifically the one, Sharma, that you mentioned around the end, reaching reaching home or end, ending homelessness, yeah. um, we have... Um, Savannah so Wilson will be joining Sharma for that one who is from the Toronto Alliance to End Homelessness about like, there's like the stuff that a literature review will tell you. And then there's the stuff that someone who is in it will tell you. They are not the same as you might imagine. Um, and so um, I'm very excited for that session. Um, so Safana has already sort of mentioned that like, you know, when the city of Toronto is both an active player in how we end homelessness, but also is now becoming the funder in that, like service provider and funder in the same decision-making um, pool brings up tension. And I think that's something that, you know, we're looking at as, as IRCC is proposing that we actually have service provider organizations take on a deeper funding role. Um, so something to be considered. Um, and if you end up being included in those learning sessions, we will also share with you recordings um, of the first two, um, but we are keeping those um, in-house to our, our learning session cohort members. Um, if you are still in your mentee, there is a question in there, but I'm not going to bring it up yet. But if you are still in there, um, you're welcome to continue to add to the current question that's in there. And I can put the... Um, link back in the chat. Um, but I thought maybe this would be a good time to answer the questions people have asked us in the question and answer section, um, which I think is where we're encouraging people to ask us more questions. Um, so actually, I'm going to do these in a little bit of separate order because Alicia, someone is interested in hearing more about what you do in the sector. And I think that's, a, a, let's create space for that. Uh, right now or after? No, right now. You answer okay. right now. <laughs> uh, so we run um, income tax program and a food support program, um, as well as um, different workshops. So it depends on, we do it based off of community needs. So we do like canvases, canvassing, and also we have open where people call me or come in and sit down in one of our programs and discuss what are things that they want to do. Um, so, for example, we have like a seniors program or mature adult. It starts at 55 plus where um, they learn different skills. It depends on what they want to learn. 
Um, or if they don't really feel like learning anything and they want to do something that they've done before, we do that. A um, lot of like food literacy, um, for example, learning how to process foods as well as STEM stuff. Like we have a 3D printer. Um, we have t-shirts machines to make sure it just depends on where the community is at. Um, so we just have pretty much a bunch of different tools and we try to do things as holistic as possible. Um, rather than just creating a program and helping people come, we actually ask, ask people what they would like um, or training that they need to further, whether it's an employment, um, we create those um, placements so that people can get the most out of our programming. Thanks, Alicia. Um, and Alicia's not doing a good service to herself because she often is like, we don't do that much, but like literally <laughs> everything you can imagine, um, including like recovery services during the pandemic, um, yeah. a lot of mental health, a lot of food security, a lot of um, like engaging. And I think the primary thing is outreach. Like Alicia knows everybody and everyone knows Alicia. And that is often not the thing that we are valuing, like monetarily valuing from our community leaders. We're just assuming, hey, do you know, could you send a couple of messages forward and, and acting like as if that's not something someone should be compensated for. And so um, Alicia brings that and so much more to our team. And that's actually one of the, like during COVID, we did a lot of research and with other community organizers and very small grassroots groups. And that was like the biggest thing that was brought up is outreach being used for outreach. Um, but then not feeling like we're valued, um, especially when organizations completely closed down and they did a really heavy lean on like community organizers and volunteers and stuff like that. I think that's where like a lot of things shown, like came to light. We're like, we're volunteers or, you know, we're actually doing work work. And then when everyone comes back to work, we're just sort of like shoved to the side. Hey, can you pass this information along? forgetting that like outreach is a whole job within itself. Um, so. Thanks for that, Alicia. Um, there is another question in here, which says, is any participant here from IRCC? Um, I don't know, anyone want to raise their hands as an IRCC person? Anyone, anyone, anyone? Um, if not, how do we plan to get the results of this study to the decision makers in the, the department? So a couple of things. Um, our team already presented at Metropolis earlier this year, and um, IRCC folks don't clearly identify themselves. So we don't know um, how much we've already shared information with IRCC directly in those kinds of knowledge moments. Um, of course, they have Sharma's beautiful 100 and something page report. Um, they also get all of our narrative reports. We have to submit narrative reports quarterly. Um, what is happening over there? We're not 100% sure of, and we know that this research project was started, so we are one of 16, um, but there's no commitment to um, incorporating any of our recommendations. There's certainly no timeline to incorporating any of our recommendations. So um, for us, we've taken a pretty specific stance, or at least I have taken a pretty specific stance that our goal is not to create something IRCC could have created on their own because otherwise, what would be the point? Um, and that our goal is to present something that is going to provoke and push a couple of buttons and call out tensions within the existing sector. And so we have made a very specific decision not to include IRCC folks in our advisories. Um, although there are several projects um, like other versions of our project that have. So it was a decision we made um, that we wanted to center newcomer and racialized leaders' voices, and that wasn't going to be possible if you put a funder in the room. And that's really fascinating. Um, and it touches, I think, on a whole lot of the themes I've been hearing across everything that everyone has had to say today. Um, 
the words that I'm hearing again and again are power and power sharing and uh, collaboration. And I'm seeing a lot of um, even relationship uh, relationships beginning here as people are getting to know Alicia and know like what she's connected to and uh, know that she has all these insights. Um, Alicia, I'm sure that in your work, you've met a whole huge number of people who have power and you are asking them to share it with you. And you're also finding your own power in the work that you are doing. Uh, so um, with the joint decision-making as well, uh, this is definitely something that I'm hearing about a lot. And this will be a goal in the community knowledge programs, new community of practice. Uh, how do we bring people together to make decisions collaboratively, to arrive at consensus uh, so that research can get done, so that agencies have the capacity both to engage in research and to apply the evidence to the settlement practices? Uh, so uh, there is um, another question in the um, Q&A. Um, someone asking about the Peel Newcomer Strategy Group yeah. and how they're facilitating discussions regarding a local funding model. Are these efforts combined? Are your efforts combined with uh, this kind of approach? Um, the answer is both yes and no. <laughs> Um, so while we know that there are 16 projects across the country, and I personally, out of a place of curiosity, tried to um, convene all 16, um, and we kind of did it like once, but definitely not in a organized uh, fashion. So I think from a more self-organizing fashion, um, Jessica specifically from Peel, her and I have had some conversations, but it's not been a part of the overall research structure that all 16 of us compare and contrast our research efforts. Um, and Peel, for example, as Sharma mentioned, is um, the place where the West Foundation prototyped their participatory funding model um, in in with the intermediary of Tamarack. Um, and in our first learning session around participatory funding models, we had Beth from Social Planning Toronto sort of give a very high level framework of participatory funding models. And then Jawad, who works at WES, talk about some of the mechanics of what that was like. Um, and I think it should be noted that both when Beth was talking about it, but also that Jawad is in a foundation. When we hear about participatory funding, we're often hearing about it from a foundation standpoint and how much trust they're giving over as a funder. Um, and I don't think that that's the same level of trust that service providers have with IRCC right now. Um, and so I think that when we're talking about sharing power and decision, it takes a funder to say, I'm handing over decision and power, and I'm not gonna come back in later to change what might have happened here. Um, and I think that takes a big leap of faith and risk um, for a funder to do that. And so I think that, um, I think as organizations across the sector are working on this, I would have loved to see more facilitated conversations across our projects, but that hasn't happened. I don't know if that answers that question. I think it does. I'll keep an eye on the Q&A to see if uh, anyone has a follow up to it. But thank you. Yeah. And I think um, although what you were saying about co-design may not seem immediately related to the idea of funding, the I think it's an important foundation to establish in any discussion of how um, projects, organizations, and so forth are funded in the future, because the co-design approach can be very useful in involving uh, the community organizations, the grassroots groups, and those who are actually out doing the frontline work um, with uh, newcomers. These are the ones um, that need to be involved in the conversations and the co-design process. Um, I think a lot of people are finding it a very useful way to do that. Yeah. Oh yeah, and I would never decouple 
co-design and funding because you need funding in order to co-design. And um, this project has enabled us to do elements of co-design. I wouldn't say we've done a full, um, even in this, in this project, I would say from an equity place, uh, we haven't done enough. There's not enough funding to truly do all the co-design pieces. Um, and and like um, in the West Tamarack example, there was 600,000 given in funding dollars. There was, I think, almost the equivalent given in intermediary and paying for process to happen. I don't know the exact number, um, but it was considerable. Um, to honor the fact that like you have to have a facilitator, you need to pay people to show up to participate, um, that every single contribution is valued as a part of it, as opposed to what we often assume, which is um, the, the pleasure of being invited is not enough and certainly not is a 10 or $15 gift card either. Um, and so actually being able to create an equity standard for when we're engaging with newcomers in the work. Right. And I, I think um, this is a good segue into a question from Marco Campana about IRCC's new equity stream, which is included in their call for proposals. Um, Marco says that the recent presentation slides from IRCC indicate that funding intermediary organizations to redistribute funds, as you've mentioned here in participatory grant making, yep. To redistribute funds, support not currently funded grassroots groups that serve and represent equity deserving groups in order to build their capacity to effectively deliver settlement services. Um, has this stream, are you aware of the stream? Has it been influenced by research that uh, you and others in the sector have done into looking into regional models of settlement funding? And do you have any insights or ideas about how this new equity stream might roll out? Uh, hi, Marco. Um, the We just found out about it as a project team um, shortly after um, our admin partner went to a bunch of consultations. Um, and then I personally saw those slide decks on Marco's LinkedIn. Um, so the, I think my, my, my initial reactions to that is, um, are we just going to recreate power structures? Like, are we just going to download money from IRCC to a big organization? And then the organizations are going to continue to manage the outcomes, outputs, frameworks, and like how much responsiveness is there going to be between um, to do the work of equity? I don't, I don't know. I don't know what frameworks exist there. I've gotten very limited um, exposure to that content. Um, and I think that I, I and I would love to think that some of our work could be attributed, but I know that that's not something we can prove in this moment either, because I imagine that started a long time before this research project um, started, if we're now seeing it pop up in IRCC collateral. Um, uh, Marco is asking, how would you recommend these intermediate organizations do this redistribution ideally? Um, I think they have to work with an intermediary that doesn't see themselves trying to um, also have a piece of that pie, but are there to be the third party to um, document and make recommendations based on inequities they're seeing um, that are centered around sharing power, building relationships, using participatory means and capacity building that like that needs to not be seen as um, mostly being held within the go between. So I think it, it, it requires partnership. I think it can't be one organization that takes all of it and then they hand out um, funds. I think there needs to be a third party in there. Sounding to me like um, this is yet another opportunity for co-design. Yeah, I mean, slightly biased, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and another question um, from Amina. Yeah. I work independently to help the newcomers in my community. Is there any way I can find funding to help me with delivery of furniture? Can you suggest any resources where I apply? Wow, so somebody doing independent grassroots stuff. Mm. Um, most of the newcomer families are not able to afford to buy anything as the money they receive from IRCC goes towards their rental. 
I unfortunately don't have an answer to that. That sounds like something that would be organized at a grassroots level. Um, mm -hmm. Alicia, any thoughts on, from a grassroots perspective, how you get resources quickly when they're seen as outside of IRCC eligibility? Um, I would try reaching out to local organizations to see how you can leverage resources. Like if it's just for delivery within itself, I would think of an organization you know has like a truck um, and start there or ones that have done something similar and maybe they have some sort of petty cash that you can partner with them. I know it kind of then becomes their project, um, but if you're thinking about getting resources to people, that would be the best way in short notice um, to get that stuff delivered if you're just looking to get the stuff delivered. Right. We've had a suggestion of um, the furniture bank, but yeah. unfortunately it appears that they have a considerable waiting period, which gets back to the issue of inadequate funding. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's also a sense of like, um, some things are responsive and need urgency in that moment and they don't need to wait for um, all of the pieces to fall in place. And so I think to what Alicia is saying is like using the assets or knowing what the assets are at a local level and can be redistributed quickly, but that's not always something people are privy to. Um, and it comes from that work that Alicia is talking about of like self-organizing and community connections that are often seen as um, an, a lower tier or invaluable sort of service. Mm -hmm. Um, there's another question here, which is in this community participatory planning process, how are political advocacy processes integrated? For example, the current housing crisis and the increase in homelessness are linked to public policies that for decades have created a social and economic imbalance that causes certain groups to be excluded from the possibility of paying, buying housing or paying rent. Um, our next learning session is specifically about public education and policy. Um, and because we are very aware of the fact that making recommendations to IRCC and waiting on the potential that they might integrate our recommendations is much longer than we might have time for in the current moment. Um, and so we are really gonna be talking about what things can be done at a local grassroots organizational level where we're not waiting on IRCC in order to um, respond. Um, so I think that kind of lends itself to this question, but also the furniture bank question is like, what can we do outside of the um, structures? I think that's an incredibly important point because um, as the report makes clear, there are a whole lot of people for whom the structures don't really work. They, they aren't included in the structures, like what Sharma was saying about people with temporary status or people who are not, who are moving in and out of eligibility for IRCC funding or people in the same family who have different types of immigration status. Um, it's all, yeah, it's all very, very complex. And um, when we look at the community level, people are often able to say, hey, why don't you do this? Or I know somebody who has a truck or um, just, so there's, I see a tension between um, existing power structures and existing systems and the systems that people build within their own communities to provide community support and community care. And I think that it's really important to get the grassroots folks and the funders, the researchers, the academics, um, and the, even the larger service providers who are more spread across the city and who or through the GTA and who are more entrenched and who tend to get the bulk of the funding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think it's very, very important that everybody connects and communicates with each other and they're all at the same table. And Alicia, as you were pointing out, um, just um, being included is not enough. 
you have to have a voice and you have to be able to share the power. Yeah. And I, yeah, and I, would, I would push back on the like at the same table thing because um, we we have different kinds of structures set up within this project because I know, for example, Alicia is not always going to share all of her wisdom when we are surrounded by some of the bigger players. Um, and so and and even within our project, we have an advisory where we have tried very hard to stay with like smaller uh, organizations. And during the um, service provider focus groups, we very specifically separated service provider groups. We separated them based on size of organization, small, medium, and large. Um, and so we, we did have a conversation with large organizations. And when I say large, I mean over 10 million um, and multi-service. And we know that those are also primor primarily white-led organizations. And so what does sharing power look like when it means taking away potentially from your quote unquote piece of the pie um, and redistributing or sharing or you know supporting or whatever it is. So the the stakes in these showing up at the table are really different. And so I think that's where that intermediary work is really important. That makes sense. That does make sense. Yeah. Um, someone has said you would appreciate the upcoming sessions date and time. Um, oh, the learning session around public policy is on November 16th, and the one on collaborative governance is on the 22nd. Is there a uh, pointer to those on a website available that you could share? Yeah, so there's already, I, I popped into the chat the um, intake form. Um, so if you are specifically a Toronto South service provider, that's where our eligibility comes into play. Um, and, and you can find those, those posters on either my, like on the Department of Imaginary Affairs or Toronto South Lips um, LinkedIn pages. Um, and then if you're not from Toronto South and can't come to our learning sessions in January, we will have a town hall, which will be open to anyone who's sort of interested in like, what have we come up with over the last three years? But there will also be invitations at that point to add feedback to the model we'll be presenting um, to say, this is good. This sucks. This is, I wish you had done more work around this, you know, like, um, and we will continue that. And all of those feedback uh, pieces will go into our final report. So continuing conversations. Yes. Yeah, that's great. Okay. Um, we're getting fairly close to time here. And I just wanted to ask everybody one last question. What is a point that you would like everyone who is in attendance today to take home with them? What is some, yeah, what is the, the main point that you would like folks to take home that will help them in their practice? Um, I think kind of aligned to that, Emily, is the question that I have in Menti, and maybe that will support people to respond to it, which is what supports for community knowledge can be integrated into a community-based funding model? So um, any ideas, things that you heard from this session, but also you want, like, we need funding in order to get this, like, this is, do it there, because we will put that in our report. <laughs> Um, and it helps us frame everything that we're learning. And and I think I already mentioned we can share out the results so everyone can see them after the fact too. That's great, thank you. Yeah. Sharma, did you have anything to add? Sorry, just looking for my unmute. Um, just to say thank you, I think that question uh, what is the take home piece? I, I actually found myself going back to what Jennifer st started us off with. And it's like, don't stop dreaming. <laughs> you know, even though times are challenging, sometimes doing this type of work is, uh, can be, you know, you, you hit wall after wall. Um, it doesn't mean not to stop pushing yourselves and others to think creatively and be innovative and, um, yeah, trying to push the boundaries wherever possible. Um, and Sharma, I'm always happy to counter that with, I have a lot of trouble dreaming and hoping. Um, like I said, it, like in my um, bio, it says I am a struggling idealist. And while I am in a job where we are imagining equitable futures, I think being rooted in the like, all the challenges of today were not always the challenges of today. 
It took time for us to get to these challenges. So it will take us time to get out of these challenges. And we are the ones who are going to make those go away. We are not here to rely on IRCC to wave a magic wand and to make them go away. So like the more evidence we can build for what we need, the more likely we'll be talking about different challenges in five years from now. I don't imagine no challenges, but ideally different challenges. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Alicia, do you have anything um, else that you would like to add? What is a message that you would like to share with our participants today? Um, I would say always think holist holistically when it comes to working with the community. What does that mean for you, Alicia, working holistically? Um, holistically means looking at the whole picture, like all the different pieces. That's important. So not just the workers, but also the clients. Um, also the surrounding building, like everything works together. Mm -hmm. And like, for example, we can get all the funding in the world, but we don't, if we don't have an actual space to do it, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of useless. Like we still have to work with everybody um, in order to get things done and to make a difference. And also to have more community based approaching is to actually involve the community. And they can only do so is if they have the right capacity. Um, otherwise they may feel like it's even more work. So just thinking about everything as a whole, um, yeah. Okay, yeah. So thank you, Alicia. We've heard about a lot today and um, thinking about the whole thing, it's easy to get caught up in small details. It's easy to get up, get caught up in um, conflicts or things that um, in the grand scheme of things, are fairly small, but it is so important to keep looking at the big picture. I think this report does a great job of that with a whole lot of detail. And I am very much looking forward to the new work that is coming from what you're doing now, Jen, as well as from uh, what's happening at um, Social Planning Toronto and with Unified We Grow. Thank you all so much for being here today. It's been an honor. I really, really appreciate your thoughts and your feedback. And um, I hope that everyone who's been here today will uh, continue to participate in community knowledge program events, will continue to follow the work of our panelists today and um, will join us in um, our webinars in the spring. Thank you very much, everybody. I appreciate your presence and I look forward to talking to you again. Okay. Thank you all. Thank I you. hope you all have a wonderful day. <laughs>